Let's see your Bibles today. Let's see your Bibles say word. word. One more time, say word. word. Let's see your pens, pens. And lesson plan, lesson plan. Let's turn to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. We're going to be looking at Matthew 28 and 1 Corinthians 15. Right now, Matthew 28. Matthew 28. If, by the way, if you are a visitor here from out of town, your first time here, can you raise your hand? We can welcome you. God bless you. God bless all y'all. God bless y'all. God bless you. Okay, five people clap. I know they got their hands in their Bible, so God bless y'all. Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for uh, just all the talented people that give up their time to make these services happen, to bless our community. We thank you more than everything for dying and rising from the dead. Thank you that you're not in that tomb. And we thank you that your resurrection does so many things for us. We'll look at tonight. We just thank you and praise you for being God. And thank you that none of us in this room are God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Can I get an amen on that one? Amen. Man, look at the person next to you and said, I'm so thankful you ain't God. <laughs> and I'm so thankful I ain't God. <laughs> uh, there was a, a Marine recently taking classes in college and uh, he was taking a class and this professor got up and said, and the Marine had done tours in Afghanistan and Iraq, and the, the professor says, you know, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. As a matter of fact, I challenge God to prove that he really exists by knocking me off the stage in the next five minutes. And I dare God to prove that he exists, and even if he doesn't, he doesn't exist. So the, the professor was talking trash, you know, for up to five, you know, three minutes, four minutes, and the class was silent. They couldn't believe this guy was calling out God. You don't want to call out God. Don't call out God. This guy's calling out God, calling out to God, and right as it got past four minutes, the Marine jumped out of his seat and cold cocked the guy in his face and knocked him off the stage. <laughs> then he sat back down. And everybody in, the, everybody in the audience was like, yo, what's that dude doing? The professor woke up, you know, and he said, what are you doing? He says, brother, God is too busy protecting the troops in Afghanistan to give you the right to say nonsense like that. So I figured I'd help him out, okay? <laughs> now, I am not at all advocating violence. This is a story. I'm just telling you what happened. It's just a story. I'm not all advocating violence. But we all know that there's a God. There's no doubt. There's no, there's no doubt. Some people believe it's not a God. But the resurrection is the most infallible proof that there's a God. Because a man named Jesus Christ says, I'm going to die a brutal death. And I'm going to rise from the dead. And so now we all know the story. That's why we're in church. That's why people come to church twice a year on Christmas and Easter. Because they know Jesus. <laughs> they know Jesus. <laughs> They're called the creases, right? And uh, they, they come to church on Christmas and Easter because they, Jesus was born and then Jesus died. Even my neighbors, were, hey, happy Easter, happy Easter, people, happy Easter. Because we acknowledge, yes, he, he rose. He rose. But what is the significance? It's one thing to know what happened. The other thing is, know, is to know significance. So I'm going to talk about the three sig most significant aspects and components of benefits we have of the resurrection. But let's review the story just in case we all don't know. Jesus Christ lived 33 years. He had a three-year ministry. He had 12 disciples. And during that three-year ministry, he established that he was God. He was worshipped as God. He exercised power over the weather. He exercised power over disease. He exercised power over demons. And he exercised power over death by raising people from the dead. He taught the Old Testament and took the Old Testament law to another level. He told the, the, the Pharisees or the, the, the religious from the Old Testament who believed in the Old Testament, said, no, here's really what it meant. And so he demonstrated, he actually gave his names, he assumed names that are attributed to God. The great I am, the son of man. He forgave sin that only God can forgive. And so he did all these things. Then he says to his disciples, I'm going to uh, be arrested, I'm going to die. And they did. They arrested him. His disciples betrayed him and another disciple denied him. They had four illegal trials. He was innocent in every trial. They said that we find no fault in him. They beat him anyway. They pulled his beard out. They punched him in the face. They hit him with rods. They stuck two-inch thorns in his head. They whipped his back with nine leather straps and metal and bone chips in the straps to rip the skin and muscle off the bone. Then he carried a cross up a hill where they nailed him, and he hung for six hours. His heart, all of our hearts are in a sack called pericardium sack, and his heart exploded in the sack. He died of a broken heart. Then they put him in a tomb. That's all well documented. 
And the reason he did all that is because he was paying for our sin. The Bible says he who had no sin became sin. He didn't have sin, so he died for our sin. If you ever complain that God is not fair, you are right. If he was fair, you would die for your own sin. Amen. He's righteous. Praise the Lord, he ain't fair. So next time something unfair happens, you just shut your mouth. <laughs> Say, God, I'm good. They're talking behind my back. God, I'm good. They said something negative about me or it wasn't true. I'm good with that because I'd rather you give me, graciously protect me from what I really deserve. Jesus did not deserve to die. He died, they put him in a tomb, and because he told everybody that he was going to rise in three days, they put, a, they put him in a tomb, they sealed the tomb with the government seal. And they put soldiers in front of the tomb, or let me put it this way, they put their equivalent of Navy SEAL special forces in front of the tomb. Nobody was going to get through these brothers. They had Uzis, they had light, oh, night scope, they had they, all their armor. Nobody was going to get the body of Jesus. Jesus laid in the tomb. He was just chilling. He says, ah, in three days, I'm getting up. There ain't nothing you can do about it. <laughs> when I was playing football, we had a guy, uh, 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 his name was Doki Williams. He ran, like, really fast. <laughs> and when he was going to, you know, when we would cover him one-on-one -on -one or we would practice, you know, you never know what the route of the receiver is because if you know the route, you can defend it. So they go in the huddle and they call it a little play. So he would come out and he says, I'm going deep. He would tell you, I'm going straight up the field, and then he would say, there's nothing you can do about it, because he was that fast. <laughs> you, you can start running now. I'm going to get right by you. It don't matter. So Jesus, Jesus is in the, in the tomb. He says, I'm getting up, and there's nothing you can do about it. So they put the, the guards in front of the tombs, and the Jews are thinking, if they take his body, he's gonna, he's, everyone's going to believe him. They knew how important it was that he would rise from the dead. And he says, on the third day, Sunday morning, I'm getting up. I'm going to tell you when it's going to happen. Let's read Matthew 28. Matthew 28, verse 1. It says, After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. You are not going to resist an angel. Verse 3, his countenance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And the guards shook for fear. Now, these, when he says guards, these are not like, you know, rent cops These are the highest trained military men on the planet, the Roman, Roman army. The guards shook for fear and became like dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, notice how the women weren't shaken for fear, but the guards were? Mm -hmm. You know, girl, sister, girl, like, get out of my face. I want to see Jesus. <laughs> Verse 5, an angel answered and said, do not, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. And here's what he said. He is not here. He is risen just as he said. Everyone say, just as he said. Say praise the Lord. <laughs> and it says, verse 6, he is not here. He is risen just as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Look, it's empty. Go quickly and tell your disciples that he has risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. And there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring the disciples word. Okay. The Mary Magdalene, the other Mary go, the tomb is open, the stone is rolled, the, 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 the angels are sitting up on the stone, chilling, white robes, lightning. I mean, how, what did that dude look like? Mr. Clean on steroids. <laughs> the guards all shaking on the ground. Oh, and the ladies, we ain't, we ain't scared of him. He's one of us. He's on our side. And the angel starts talking to them and said, look, go inside and look at the tomb. If you go to Israel today... You go in the tomb, he's not there. The people do this every day. They go in and say, nope, he ain't there. And then you come out, you pay the $2. The next person goes in, no, he ain't there. It happens every day. <laughs> so they, he said, go look, proof. He's not here. So there were people who, there were, many people saw, saw him after his resurrection. The disciples saw him after his resurrection. Evidence that he rose. Downing Thomas touched him after his resurrection. Evidence that he rose. Paul saw him. 500 people saw him. There's an empty tomb. The, road, the stone was rolled away. The seal that the government put on it to seal the tomb closed was broken. The guards were paid money. Matter of fact, we're not going to read it, but if you look at the end of the chapter, the guards were paid money to say that they, they, they took them. 
Okay, they went AWOL. That don't happen. They were, they, they were there with their life on the line. They said, we're just going to appease you. Don't, don't punish the, the soldiers. We're just going to just let it go by. Because we don't want people to think he really rose. There's all this evidence. As a matter of fact, more evidence is that the disciples who were running scared when he died, all of a sudden after they saw him, were bold as a lion. Read the New Testament. After this, all the disciples, matter of fact, every single one of them except Judas who killed himself, died for their faith. Why? Because they believed, in a, they believed in Christ's message. Why? Because he rose from the dead. Okay, so he rose. We know you, you can't find his body. Matter of fact, if you want to discredit Christianity, which people have been trying to do for thousands of years, all you have to do is produce the body. That's all you got to do. One guy. It's like you, know, you, can't find Obama, you can't find bin Laden. Go find Jesus. <laughs> if you just find his body, Christianity is done. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Okay, he rose from the dead. So what does that mean for us? It means some very specific, important things that we need to keep in mind. Number one in your notes. The resurrection provides a foundation for our faith. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead gives us something secure to believe in. Look what it says in verse 12, chapter 15, verse Corinthians. It says, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty and our faith is empty. Listen to what this is saying. If Jesus Christ is still in the grave or if he's buried somewhere else and we haven't found him, and he didn't rise from the dead, what we believe in is empty. You remember what the angel said. He is risen just as he said. Everyone say just as he said. You know what that means? That everything else he said is true. If he says, I'm going to be killed, I'm going to be buried, and I'm going to rise from the dead, and he rises from the dead, and by the way, he rose from the dead on time. (laughs) Don't you think that he can forgive you if he can rise from the dead? Don't you think he can encourage you if he can rise from the dead? Don't you think he hears your prayers and can respond to your prayers if he rises from the dead? Almost definitely, 1975, I believe, was 70 or 75, Bruce Lee died. And he said, like, in five years, I can't remember what the time period was that he was going to rise from the dead. And Bruce Lee, was, I mean, how many of y'all remember Bruce Lee? Bruce Lee was a bad dude. He was, you know, Bruce Lee was only 135 pounds. That's it. He was a little, little itty brother, but he was bad. Woo! <laughs> and he said... Oh, I don't know what, maybe he didn't say it. I I heard the rumor that he was going to rise from the dead after he wrote. And I believed him because that dude was bad. (laughs) He's still dead. If someone says, I'm going to rise from the dead, I'm going to believe everything else they said. Because if he has power over death, he's got power over gossip. He's got power over your fear. He's got power over your low self-esteem and your poor self-image. He's got power over your life in the, in the sense that he can raise you from the dead. We're going to see in a minute. But the point is that everything else in the Bible becomes true. That means if you believe it, your foot is on a rock. That's why we call the church the rock, by the way. For reals. It's a rock. It's an immovable object. Christ is the rock of our salvation. Don't move. Sure. Solid. If you doubt Jesus... Well, everything he said about doubters and Jesus' haters will come true also. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. But then in Matthew 25, it says for all those who reject him, they will, be, uh, they will go to a place called hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And by the way, hell was not created for any people. It's created for the devil. But if you reject the salvation of Christ... That's the only alternative for you because we're all eternal. He has to do that. And so the fact that he's risen, everything that we believe in and everything we put our faith in is absolutely true. My, when, when, my, uh, when I was a kid, we used to go up in the mountains with our family 
And, and my grandparents, they retired up in the mountains. They had this stream on their property. And my father would tell us every time we went outside, don't get wet. Right? As a kid, what do you do? Get wet. Especially as a boy. So my brother and I would go out. My brothers and I would go out. And we would play in the stream. And there were these rocks in the stream. It was like 30 feet wide. And there were these rocks sticking out of water. And we would try to get across to the other side by stepping on the rocks. Well, one day my brother stepped on a rock. And it looked like a big rock. But unfortunately, underneath it was sitting on a small rock. And when he stepped on it, it just toppled over like that, and he fell in the water. But it was like slow motion. He was falling in the water going, I'm getting a whooping. <laughs> and you could hear it like, <laughs> hey, he was completely submerged. And I'm like, and I'm going to tell daddy. <laughs> we always got wet, so what we ended up doing was just staying out all day till we dried off. But what we were trying to do and what we should have done is stepped on rocks that didn't move. You never put your faith in stuff that's not dependable. You don't put your faith in feeling. Feelings change. You don't put your faith in experience. Experience is not all the information. You don't put your faith in, 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 in promises or, or, or someone else. To a certain degree, you put your faith in people, but to a certain degree, because people will let you down. Jesus says, you put my faith in me. I'm the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And guess what? Death can't even hold me down. So the resurrection put, gives us a foundation to put our faith in. You, you want to put your faith in something that's secure, that never, ever let you down? Jesus. Number two in your notes. The resurrection provides an opportunity to be forgiven. In other words, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, you cannot be forgiven of your sin. I'm going to say that again. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, you cannot be forgiven of your sin. Let's read. Look what it says. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 15. It says, yes, and we have found false witnesses of God if Christ didn't rise from the dead, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ." Whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead don't rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sin. Ever since the third chapter of the Bible, it has been established that sin is only forgiven by bloodshed. The most vivid story is in Exodus 11 and 12, 10, 11 and 12, the first Passover, when there were two million Jews enslaved in Egypt. And God told the Jews, I'm going to strike Pharaoh with a plague, the tenth plague, by the way. And I'm going to kill the firstborn in every family unless there was the blood of a lamb on the door. So what he told the Hebrew people is, I want you to take a lamb, bring it into your house, live with it for a couple weeks, and then I want you to kill it. And I want you to put the blood of the, door, the lamb on the door. And when the angel of death comes to Egypt, if you have the blood of the lamb on your door, the angel of death will pass over your door. Everyone say Passover. Passover. That's what Passover means. If you have the blood of the lamb, say blood of the lamb. Blood of the lamb. Say lamb without, lamb without blemish. If you have the blood of the lamb, a lamb without blemish on your door, the angel of death will pass over. Say Passover. Passover. Your door. And your, no one in your house will die. I want you to think about it. This is a very simple concept. If it's me, I'm killing that lamb right now. <laughs> Angel may come a little early, you know what I'm saying? May get watch a little mixed up. I'm killing the lamb, putting it on the door every day, blam, blam. He, he ain't putting it all on my house. <laughs> when Jesus was baptized, guess what they called him? The Lamb of God. When you get saved and you ask Christ to forgive you of your sin, guess what your name gets put in? The Lamb's Book of Life. In the book of Revelation, you're going to see a lamb that was slain. Jesus is the lamb. And Jesus is the lamb without blemish. He who had no sin became sin. The Old Testament is a foundation for the New Testament. And when the God was laying the foundation in the New Testament, you had to have bloodshed, you had to have bloodshed, you had to have bloodshed. And Jesus came and said, now I'm going to shed my blood for the sins of the world once and for all. That's what the Old Testament is for, one of many reasons. But if Jesus Christ 
wasn't a lamb without blemish. He couldn't rise from the dead. If he didn't rise from the dead, your sins aren't forgiven because he would just still be dead. Because he was holy, because he was eternal, because he was God, he rose from the dead. But if he's still in the grave, and by the way, still paying for your sin, and still dead, you you and I would not have any forgiveness. Because we have to have perfect, cleansing, sinless blood pay for our sin. You can't pay for your sin with sinful blood. That's the Old Testament. They kept killing animals. Over and over again, animal, animal, animal. And the reason the animals couldn't pay for their sin is because the animals weren't sinless. Christ was sinless, and he proved it by rising from the dead. And he rose from the dead, he overcame death. When he rose from the dead, he buried death. He took the sting of death away, and he gives us an opportunity to be cleansed and forgiven and our mind renewed. Can I get an amen? Amen. Oh, thank God that he rose. Number three in your notes. Number three. The third benefit of him rising from the dead, hmm. the resurrection provides an opportunity to live forever. How many of y'all want to live forever? Let me, let me, let me ask that question a different way. <laughs> let me ask the question a different way. How many of y'all want to get out of this life and go to a better life and live forever there? <laughs> my grandmother, I, 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 my my. Um, Grandmother that passed away, actually I have a grandmother now, she's 96, going to be 97 in a couple weeks, something like that. And my other grandmother died at 90 or so. And my other grandmother, right before she passed, I said, Grandmother, you going to make 100? She says, I hope not. <laughs> she says, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. This life is going to wear you out. But the next life, ooh. You're going to live forever. Look what it says, verse 17. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we of all men are pitiful. In other words, if all you got is just to live a good life and die and go nowhere, this is just wasting our time. But verse 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits. Everyone say first fruits. It has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In the Old Testament, when they would give an offering or a tithe of their crops, whenever they would have the harvest, the first harvest, they would give to God, part of it, they would tithe to God, and it was called their first fruits. It was the first harvest they would give to God, and they give it to him for many reasons. One, so the priests can eat. It was to support the, support the ministry. But it was also a sign that they were saying, God, we believe there's more to come. We're giving you the first because you deserve the first, but we also acknowledge that you're going to give us, you're going to provide for us. We're not worried about it. In other words, when you had a cow or a sheep and it had a baby, you would sacrifice the firstborn to the Lord and you were trusting that another baby would come. It was an act of faith. When Christ rose from the dead, he was first fruits. He was evidence that everybody else is going to rise. <laughs> Every single one of you can know you're going to rise from the dead if you have faith in Christ because Christ rose from the dead. And when Christ lived on earth, he did many things as an example to us. When he argued with the devil in the desert, he could have easily said devil and opened up his robe and just melted the devil with his glory. He could have done that. But we can't do that. So what he did when he fought the devil, he said, it is written, it is written. Every time the devil made an accusation, he just quoted the Bible. Why did he do that way? Because that's what we can do. Jesus rose from the dead. He says, guess what? You're going to rise from the dead one day. Every single one of you that have faith in Christ. Let me read a verse to you. Matt, uh, John chapter, I'm sorry. Um, John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. Jesus Christ rose from the dead and says many things. But one of those many things is that he is now alive to make good on all his promises. You're not praying to a memory of somebody. You're not praying to a legacy of somebody. You're not praying or obeying just the teachings of somebody. You are praying to somebody. Somebody who overcame death. Someone who buried your sin in the grave. 
someone who's going to come back and judge the world. He's going to come back. And so the, 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 the choice you have today is, is not only to acknowledge that he rose, but to ask yourself, am I in good standing with God? Because he is going to come back. And he is going to fulfill everything he promised, and I don't want to say threatened, but everything he said he's going to do for those who accept him and for those who reject him. For those who accept him, he's going to receive you into heaven. He's going to bless you with eternal life. For those who reject him, unfortunately, you will be separated from him for all eternity in a place called hell. God does not want you to go there. But he's not going to force you to accept him. He's not going to force you to love him. He's not going to force you to give your life to him. He sends big mouth preachers like us to try to plead with you. (laughs) Try to explain to you. Don't go there. The Bible says, Jesus said right there, if you believe in me and my words... You will have eternal life. Jesus said that about himself. And because he rose from the dead, what he's saying is, I'm going to come back and I'm going to keep my promise to hold people accountable to my word. And so in a minute, you're going to have an opportunity to say, Lord, I believe you rose from the dead. I believe you rose from the dead. And if you doubt it, just go find his body. Trust me, they've been looking for 2,000 years. 2,000 years. They haven't found him. Why? Because he ain't there. And he's going to come back. And so if you say, Lord, you know what? I believe you rose from the dead. I believe I'm a sinner. I believe you died for my sin because your resurrection is proof you had no sin. Your resurrection is proof you had no sin. So I want you to forgive me of my sin. And I want to surrender my life to you. And I want to be what the Bible calls born again, born of the Spirit of God. And I want to inherit eternal life. That's what Easter is about. Please don't let this be your holiday. That's offensive to God, that this is just a day people go to church. That is not what it's all about. It's all about him proving that everything he said is true. The good, the bad, and the ugly. The good going to heaven, the bad judgment. You don't want to be on the judgment side. So in a minute we're going to pray, and my prayer for you is that you would this day Take advantage of his resurrection power and receive him as your Savior. You're watching online. Same for you right there. Don't let this be your church day. Let this be a day you give your life to Christ and you start to have a relationship with a risen Savior. Let's all bow our heads and pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you rose. Thank you so much you are not in the grave anymore. And thank you so much for the significance of that empty tomb. We now have something we can trust is true, the gospel. We have faith that we will rise as well. Receive a heavenly body. Be with God in heaven. Our loved ones in heaven. As you listen to my voice, if you realize that, yes, Jesus did rise. Yes, I am a sinner. And you want him to forgive you of your sin. You want to receive eternal life. You want to ask Jesus to be your Savior. Just pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. A very simple prayer of confession and surrender. In the privacy of your heart, if you would like to give your life to Christ, if you would like to inherit eternal life, In the privacy of your heart, just say, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I know my sin is wrong. And I know the penalty of my sin is death. But I believe Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. I surrender my life to you. I 
I receive your forgiveness. And I receive eternal life. As our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you prayed that prayer in a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand up. By standing up, you are in your own way resurrecting from your old life. You are going to rise and walk away from your old life. By standing, you are acknowledging that you are giving your life to Jesus. And you are acknowledging that you have faith. He has forgiven you. So right now, eyes closed, heads bowed. If you prayed that prayer, just stand to your feet. God bless you. Stay standing. Very good. God bless you. God bless you. Stay standing. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. We see you. Stay standing. God bless you. God bless you. We see you in the balcony. We see you all over. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Anybody else? Stand to your feet. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Very good. Anybody else? Stand to your feet. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Now in a minute, we're going to ask all of you who are standing to come down to the altar. If you're in the balcony, all you're going to have to do is turn around and walk up and the ushers will bring you down. And I'm going to ask everybody else not to leave because we still have to take communion together. And we're going to take it with these people when they get down to the altar. So right now, if you're standing up, just come up out of your seat and come on down to the altar. And let's give them a hand as they come on down. Come on, let's give him a hand. Come on now. How you doing? How you doing? God bless you. your cup. Take your cup. Everyone got a cup? She got a cup. Okay. Let's get these people a hand coming from upstairs. Come on down. Take out that little wafer at the top. The one thing Jesus said to do in remembrance of him is to take communion, the one thing. And one of the significant aspects of taking communion is to acknowledge that his body was beaten. God bless you. 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 Like it. And Jesus said, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. Matter of fact, when you think of me, I want you to think of death. Because until you die, when I don't mean die in the grave, but until you deny yourself and start living for me, you're not going to experience life. I, he didn't come to make you rich and make you famous and make you powerful. He came to make you holy. And it happens when you deny yourself. So when we do this, we, we have to repeat reminding ourselves, it's not about me. It's not about me. When people attack you and they talk about you or whatever, you say, Lord, thank you. That's all I get. Thank you. Because he did this. Lord, we thank you that you allowed sinful man to crucify you for our sin. And we pray that we can be humble servants before you. Thank you for loving us and being good to us. 
more than we deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. Be very careful opening up this cup. The Bible says without blood shed, there is no forgiveness of sin. Jesus shed his blood. And when we take the cup, we are acknowledging that his sinless blood was shed for us. We're being reminded we are forgiven. Lord, we thank you that you shed your innocent blood for us. Thank you for being good to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I pray for all of you, and we're going to walk you all out uh, over here, um, I had a conversation with a young lady today. Her, the father of her three children was shot in broad daylight and killed two days ago, 28 years old. She said he was a breadwinner. And the young man had been involved in gangs, but he was out, had been out. Um, and the police called me and said, is there anything you can do? We're trying to find someone to help her, blah, 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 blah. Um, she has a 19-month-old, a 4-month-old, and a 6-year-old. And so if you would like to give diapers or gift card to Target or whatever, you can drop it off here anytime during the week, just a little gift card, 10, 15, 20, whatever it is. We use, matter of fact, we use gift cards all the time for benevolence reasons. Instead of giving people cash, we give them things they can go buy, what they really need. Uh, so if you would like to do that, uh, we receive those all year long. We make use of them because we get calls all the time. And so uh, I just want to throw it out there to you. Some of you may have a bunch of diapers you want to give. You, you, you have kids. You know what, what baby needs are. I, my, my kids have been long gone out of diapers, but you know what's going on out there and what they need. So if you want to help, just drop it off here. Drop it off at the thrift store. Say this is for the, uh, the young lady whose uh, boyfriend died or just for whatever we need. We want to help as many people as possible. Amen? Amen. Lord, I thank you for these people that came forward, and I pray you bless them. And I pray that this Easter would be a special one for them, the day they gave their life to you. And Lord, I pray that we continue to be a light to our city, that we would live as though the gospel is really true. There is life eternal. We have it. We want to share it. Thank you for being good to us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to ask you all to take a right turn and walk this way. Just walk that way and follow those people up there. Come on, let's give them a big hand. Come on now.